Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about something extremely important for all of us, which is sleep. And for that, I found not only an extremely pleasant person that I've talked to for a little while now, but also super smart. He is a PhD in psychology. He is a co-director of the San Francisco Bay Area Center for Cognitive Therapy. He's an assistant clinical professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He is an adjunct facil- f- faculty sorry, at the Beck Institute for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And he's written several really good concrete books on how to work with sleep, anxiety, and a lot of other stuff. He's been very busy, but luckily he's been able to keep a quiet mind as well and, uh, and a good life. And it's uh, Michael A. Tompkins that I got the pleasure of getting in today. So, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Matt. I, I've been looking forward to this. So thank you for the invitation. So, Michael, you know so much about psychology and PhD and in the forefront of some of this stuff. Big Institute is also, big is where cognitive behavioral therapy is coming from. Why is it that CPT is, is so so useful and how did you get into that? Well, uh, I uh, CBT has a very long tradition of uh, being founded on uh, research. And so back in the 60s, when Dr. Aaron T. Beck uh, founded our uh, cognitive therapy or cognitive therapy, he, it started with actually a research study. And since then, there are more research studies uh, on the uh, efficacy or the effectiveness of CBT for problems than any other any other uh, therapeutic approach. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies applied to any number of problems, whether it be anxiety disorders, depression, uh, uh, eating disorders, uh, hoarding behavior. It could, you name the problem. Uh, there's a study or multiple studies for CBT. Um, and so that was part of the appeal for me is the very strong research foundation of cognitive therapy so that when I speak about cognitive behavior therapy, I can speak with some authority and confidence that we have evidence to support the effectiveness of the treatment. Makes a lot of sense. That's also been one of the reasons why I've been very drawn to learn more about CPT. So... What are some of the main aspects of like the approach to CBT? So someone that never heard about cognitive behavioral therapy before and that might think about psychologists or people that put you on a couch and ask you about your childhood memories. What, what, would, you, uh, what would you tell them to kind of get them up to speed with uh, where are we today with CBT? Well, cognitive therapy is based upon the cognitive model. And the cognitive model is basically... Uh, the assumption that it's not the things that trouble us, it's our view of things that trouble us. And so the cognitive model assumes that cognition or our thoughts and beliefs really influence our emotional states, and our emotional states then influence our behavior. So what we focus on in cognitive therapy are two two points in um are two legs in a three-legged stool. In in a three-legged stool of cognitive therapy, there are thoughts, there are behaviors, and there are feelings. And so in cognitive therapy, we, we really focus on two of the legs in the hope of influencing the third. And what we focus on are thoughts and behaviors or actions. And so we have, and that's where the cognitive behavior therapy uh, comes from, is that The cognitive is really interventions focused on thinking, helping people actually examine situations, examine their thinking, how they appraise a situation, how they interpret a situation, and learn how that influences how they feel. And then also teaching them skills to actually change their behaviors um, in response to these feelings. Because... Uh, while cognition really influences our feelings, the things that really the thing that really disrupts our life the most is our behavior or our actions. So when we uh, re- uh, when we become depressed because of how we think about an event, 
we tend to withdraw and isolate. And so in cognitive behavior therapy, not only would we help the, the client focus on how they're thinking about things, we would also focus on helping them avoid fewer situations, get going, uh, break things down. And those are all behavioral interventions. That makes a lot of sense. So something that I learned very early when looking into psychology or coaching and so on is that the words that we use have a big influence. I can either use mm-hmm. the word that I'm very stressed or I can use the word that I'm overstimulated right now. Mm-hmm. And I can I can feel somehow in my body if I'm talking about being very stressed, kind of feels more tight and raising a bit more. Overstimulated seems a bit more positive. Of course, like you can't always trick your mind. But but that is one way at least that I can see something. Does that fit in with cognitive behavior therapy? Or? Yes, that is a that is a beautiful example of you basically reframing a language and language is influenced by our thoughts. And so when we reframe our language, uh, uh, we actually do shift our cognition. And then of course that has an effect upon your feelings, you know, mm. how you feel, which is, a, this is a beautiful example. Even like, how we like anger can actually be influenced by the words we use to describe a situation we or or our response to it so we can use the word enraged uh, which will definitely have an effect on our level of anger or we we could use you know a more modified uh version like you know well i'm i'm ticked Mm. off um Either way, that kind of uh, reframing of language can influence how we feel. Yeah, I find that so fascinating. And also how that you actually catch yourself in what words are you using. I also learned that saying like, uh, cannot, always, Mm -hmm. never. Words like that can be not that beneficial to use because they put much more of a limitation and also a harder feeling that things are never going to get better things are not optimal exactly. right now or mm-hmm. i can never achieve that i i need to develop the competencies to achieve that or this will be a challenge or something else yeah this is like a good example of black and white thinking what we might call black and white thinking which is uh, all never um uh are really have an influ- much stronger influence on how we feel than more reasoned, balanced thinking. That um, another good for, uh, example of this that you're speaking to are things like shoulds, and have tos, and musts, where we actually have these very uh, good examples of all or nothing thinking. So when we tell ourselves we should do something, then what that does is have a much more a profound effect upon how we feel than the alternative, which would be do I want to do this or not? And to be able to actually evaluate uh, whether the advantages and disadvantages of doing something rather than not doing something, um, and rather than just doing something, just because we had this thought, I should do that. Okay. And so this this shoulding on hers, these shoulds that we're we, that we use to kind of like uh, berate ourselves, really has an effect upon how we feel. We can feel more anxious, more stressed. Uh, more upset with ourselves and uh, uh, and more guilty and sometimes more ashamed. And so, again, perfect examples that you're raising about the influence of our thinking on our our feelings. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. I find language so fascinating and how that creates our reality and also our feelings. Mm-hmm. I also used instead of saying I need to do a workout, I try to use the word that I want to do movement or play. Mm-hmm. It's basically mm-hmm. the same thing, mm-hmm. and I know some friends think I'm I'm crazy, that <laughs> <laughs> that is just a, a play with uh, with lyrics or with with words. But for me, it gives a different feeling again and different meaning that I I get to do some movement with some friends or I get to do play, instead of that I need to go do a workout. That's beautiful. Also, anyone who listens to music and listens to lyrics, that uh, we have part of what we love music is that with with lyrics or not it has an effect upon our Mm. feelings and so you know we can get swept up in certain lyrics um that actually move us yeah as does poetry as does literature so you know this way that we use language 
and how it tracks into how we think about things definitely has an effect upon our our day-to-day experiences. Makes a lot of sense. So how we know a lot of people are having problems sleeping. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but they they're quite high. And and we know sleep mm-hmm. is super important for our health and our cognitive um abilities and just in general being happy. I know that if I don't get proper sleep, I'm I'm not a happy camper. Most people often comment that I'm mm-hmm. I'm often quite happy and joyful or bubbling energy, but I also make sure that I get seven to eight hours of sleep every single day. If I mm-hmm. only get four hours of sleep, I'm not that happy. So so I can totally relate. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people are having problems getting those seven to eight hours despite going to bed at a decent time. How how can we use mm-hmm. CPT for that and what are some of the reasons for that? Well, uh, uh, sleep, it, like you're saying, is one of the basics. There's sleep, there's nutrition, there's exercise. Right? And when you're not attending to the basics, it will have dramatic influence on how you feel and even how you perform on a day-to-day basis. Sleep, when you're not sleeping well, everything Mm. is harder. Um, If you tend to run anxious, you know, your anxiety may be a little more or or stress. If you tend to be occupied in a stressful profession and you haven't slept well, the level of stress you have will be higher. So sleep is definitely one of the basics that we want to attend to. At the same time, not everyone really requires seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Um, And how much sleep we actually require changes over the course of um, our lives. So when we're very, very young, we definitely benefit from more sleep. But as we age, we often do not require as much sleep. And even the sleep that we get when we, we, as we age is quite different sleep. So I think one of the things that happens for people is that they have disruptions in their sleep. We all have disruptions in our sleep. Um, We can have a disruption in our sleep because we're not feeling well. We might have a disruption in our sleep because, you know, we're jet lagged. Uh, We've been traveling a lot. Or we might have a disruption in our sleep because of some, you know, ongoing stress that we're experiencing. So disruptions in sleep are completely normal. What creates insomnia is how we respond to those disruptions in sleep. So often what happens is that we we tend to try to get to sleep. And so that is what we call sleep effort, Uh, um, exhibiting effort to try to get to sleep. Um, And so then we start changing things around to try to get to sleep. Um, so we might try to stay in bed longer to, pr- to create more opportunity for sleep. We might nap because we are tired. We might use caffeine during the day to stay awake. We may go to bed uh, earlier to try to produce more opportunity for sleep. Those sleep behaviors tend to actually disrupt our sleep. And so one way to think about sleep are what are called the three P's or Spillman's three P's. The first P is basically perpetuating factors. These are typically genetic factors that have to do with, you know, our sleep structure, um, our uh, tendency toward mental arousal, those things we inherit. We all have those and those aren't necessarily a problem. Um, Then we have precipitating events, and these are like the sleep disruptors. So we might have, you know, a period of of stress or, you know, uh, jet lag, which precipitate a period of sleeplessness or difficulty sleeping. And then we have these perpetuating factors. These are the factors that maintain insomnia. And what CBTI or cognitive therapy for insomnia target are those perpetuating factors. There's not much we can do about our genetics. You know, we, we inherit that. Um, and there's not much we actually often can do about precipitating events. Um, 
sometimes a precipitating event that's on, that tends to come up regularly, we might be able to actually develop a, a plan to kind of manage it. But oftentimes, we, you know, these, these precipitating events are things that we can't anticipate. But what we do have a lot of influence over are what we do in response to uh, having a sleep disruption. Those are the perpetuating factors that I've kind of touched on. So what CBTI really focuses on are those, you know. So we have arousal factors. Um, so we basically can teach, you know, uh, ways to kind of calm your mind, calm your body, prepare your mind and body for sleep. That might be mindfulness. It might be progressive muscle relaxation. It might be diaphragmatic breathing. We also have thinking techniques to, that also kind of help with mental arousal, uh, having people, helping people learn strategies to worry less, worry less about the events in life, but also worry less about their sleep. And then we also in CBTI teach people uh, different behaviors. So one of the classic ones that occurs for people is the amount of time they spend in bed awake. So when you are struggling with chronic insomnia, what you're trying to do is you spend a lot of time in bed trying to produce a lot of opportunity for sleep in the hope that sleep will come, right? Or to try to get to sleep. What happens for us is this phenomenon called conditioned arousal. It's kind of like classical conditioning, like Pavlovian conditioning. People are probably familiar with this idea that came out of this research, you know, decades and decades ago, in which, you know, Pavlov was able to actually, you know, uh, condition dogs to start salivating when they heard the bell ring, because he had conditioned them to do that. What can happen for us in conditioned arousal is that our minds can be conditioned to be alert if we spend time in bed awake. So one of the behaviors that we start to change for people is how much time they're in bed um, and trying to actually optimize uh, their sleep drive. By, you know, if you're not in, uh, if sleep doesn't come in 20 minutes, get out of bed and this is what you do. So there are a number of behavioral interventions that we use to basically optimize sleep drives. There are also a number of interventions we use to optimize the clock drive. So we have like two drives that kind of work in parallel with each other. One is called the sleep drive. This is, you know, our, our, uh, the, our appetite for sleep. And our appetite for sleep changes over the course of the day. Then we have this Circadian clock, rhythm? Or... Which is a biologic circadian rhythm, yes, which is our biologic clock. And these two, th these two biologic drives work kind of in tandem with each other. And what happens for us is that we start making changes that affect our sleep drive, meaning napping is the best example of that. When we nap, we basically snack, and, uh, and so our sleep appetite diminishes. So when we actually get to the point of actually wanting to sleep at, at bedtime, we don't, we're not as hungry for sleep because we've kind of snacked several times over the course of the day. So a number of the interventions in CBTI are really focused on optimizing that sleep drive. Then we have sleep clock um, interventions. So, so also Michael, just to, if I can just is, jump in. Mm -hmm. So napping, I think, is, is super Please interesting. Do. So I've read a lot about sleep and that how napping can be super beneficial. If you only, ideally, either you nap between a half an hour and an hour and a half. If you only nap in half an hour, you don't go into the deeper stages of sleep. So it won't have the same effect, I guess, on your sleep appetite. If you nap an hour and a half, it definitely needs to be before, I think it's two o'clock or so. Otherwise, you really impact your sleep appetite, as you call it, because then you have a really hard time falling asleep. Exactly. Exactly. And in fact, I would say napping is okay if you don't struggle with insomnia. If you don't struggle with insomnia, taking a 20 or 30 minute nap or even taking an hour nap is probably fine. But if you struggle with insomnia, 
napping is not something you want Got to it. be doing for the reasons that you're saying. So it really is like uh, uh, being able to actually understand and accept that if you have insomnia, there are certain things that you that are probably not in your best interest to do. So and one of them is napping. Um, and the other is staying in bed when you are not uh, asleep. Um, if you don't struggle with insomnia, sleeping in is probably something, you know, staying in bed is probably fine. If you struggle with insomnia, it's not a good idea to do that. And in fact, uh, they, those are examples of sleep behaviors that actually perpetuate your insomnia. And we want, we work with people to change those behaviors. Got it. So if I, for example, I heard that don't work with your computer in bed because you change the mm -hmm. environment. So ideally the bedroom should, if you have the possibility and live in a big enough apartment or house, it should only be for sleep and sex. That's right. And if you're sick and if you're sick, you know, the three S's, you know, sick, yeah. sleep, sex, it's very true. And again, what you're working on is this idea of conditioned arousal. You want to actually condition your mind to associate bed yeah. with sleep. So uh, don't work in bed. Don't don't uh, watch you know uh, movies in bed. Don't do any of that. Find a different place in your room or in your home uh, to do that. Even if, if you know if you um, you're you're sharing a, a household with people, eat and you uh, can't necessarily use the entire residence set up a place within your bedroom that you can that you're comfortable so that you can actually do those activities but not in bed the other thing about like uh computer uh like screens um it's probably more important to pay attention to what you're doing on a screen than actually the, the screen itself So um, if you are watching exciting movies just before bedtime, it's probably, and you're watching it on, on a screen, it's probably more important that you actually have a wind down routine where you are actually on a screen, but you're actually engaged in a less uh, arousing content. So, uh, you, you, you know, reading, for example, reading a, uh, A novel, you know, uh, on on screen is probably fine. Reading the news necessarily might not be, because it might be quite arousing to your mind. So being being you know thoughtful about how you use screens as you approach bedtime, um, I think is more important than just being on whether you're on a screen or not. That makes a lot of intuitive sense for sure. I also use filters, so I have some software called Iris. This Iris and Flux, mm -hmm. which filter out the blue light at certain certain times, mm -hmm. so it doesn't activate that in my in my eyes in the same way. But I can also yeah. feel like depending yes. on Good. what I'm interacting with later in the evening, whether my energy level or arousal goes up, or whether it's something that kind of calms me down and take. So I think whether you have insomnia exactly. or just want to improve your your sleep, that that makes so much sense to focus on that as well. Exactly. And also, I think one of the things that's really important about CBTI is that people have really um, often have assumptions about sleep that are not accurate. And those assumptions, those inaccurate assumptions lead them to actually change their behavior. So if you, for example, if you believe that somehow eight hours of sleep is absolutely what you require, then you will go out of your way to try to get eight hours of sleep. But there are many people who actually don't require eight hours of sleep. They function absolutely fine on less than eight hours of sleep. There are other people who actually benefit from more than eight hours of sleep. So knowing actually what your true sleep appetite is, is a very important thing. Um, And also what we know is that the amount of sleep is less important than how deeply you sleep. And I think you were referring to this earlier, is that if you have, if you're 
you know, if you sleep eight hours, but you go, but you don't go fully into all the stages of sleep, because perhaps, perhaps you, the, the night before you were out with friends and you had had, you know, one or two more beers than you usually do, right? That alcohol will affect the depth with which you sleep. So you might be asleep for eight hours, but you might not sleep as deeply for that eight hours. And uh, we, we do know that the depth of sleep is really important. Another thing that we know about sleep is that, and this is very, this can be very helpful if you worry about your performance uh, if, on a night that you don't sleep as much as you would like, is that the most restorative sleep happens in the first two to three hours of sleep. So if you get two to three hours of sleep, that's deep sleep and actually restorative sleep, you, you're likely to be fine for the day. You might be a little bit more uh, sleepy, um, but your performance is, it's very unlikely that your performance is going to be dramatically affected uh, by having a, uh, by your, your sleep. So actually knowing how much sleep you really require is the first step. And what we, that's actually the first step in CBTI uh, when we actually start people recording uh, the features of their sleep, including how often they awaken and when, when, when they go to bed and when they get out of bed. So how do you figure out how much sleep you need for your body? Like how, well, how would you recommend people do that? That is a great question. And it's a fundamental question. What we use is a, a sleep diary, uh, which asks people to basically record uh, all different kinds of qualities uh, about their sleep. So like, when is their lights out time? That's really when they actually get in bed and they turn out the lights. What time do they awaken? If they awaken during the night, how many times do they awaken and how long do they believe they, they estimate they were awake? What time do they awaken in the morning? How long does it, is it before they actually get out of bed? So we, we, we have clients record all these different details about their sleep. And then what we do is we actually help them calculate sleep efficiency. And in fact, we're more, particularly early on, we're more interested in uh, our clients' sleep efficiency than we are the quantity and quality of the sleep. Because clients who struggle with insomnia are over-focused on the quality and quantity of their sleep. So what we move them to is what is, is being focused on sleep efficiency. And what sleep efficiency is, is basically the ratio times 100% of the uh, amount uh, of, the total amount of time, a time of sleep in bed over the total amount of time in bed. Okay. And so people with chronic insomnia, well, let me say, people who sleep really well uh, tend to be in a 90% sleep efficiency range. No one is at 100% sleep efficiency because in order to be at 100% sleep efficiency, you would have to go to sleep immediately on getting in bed and you would have to get out of bed immediately on awakening. Very few people just typically do not have 100%. They might have 98%. Um, but our sleep efficiencies change over time as age, age in particular. So older adults, their sleep efficiencies, people who don't struggle with insomnia, who sleep perfectly well, their sleep efficiencies are a little lower, maybe the low to mid 80s. People with chronic insomnia, their sleep efficiencies are sometimes like 50 uh, or less than 60%. And the reason is that they're spending too much time in bed awake. So if you are spending a lot of time in bed awake, your sleep efficiency is going to be lower. So what we're trying to do, again, with this idea of conditioned arousal and optimizing sleep drive, is we're trying to actually help people spend less time in bed awake. And when we help them achieve that, their sleep efficiency will go up. So we 
use a sleep diary to actually be able to calculate. And so what we're trying to do is once the sleep drive is optimized, ideally with an I, uh, op, ideally optimized sleep drive, you go in, you, you do lights out in bed, sleep comes relatively quickly, and then you sleep until the alarm goes off and then you get out of bed, right? What we do is we basically try to count, help the person adjust their time in bed to their true sleep drive. If your time in bed is uh, linked and optimized to your true sleep drive, you will be asleep most of the time you are in bed. So we use a sleep drive diary to calculate mm. that. And then once we actually calculate the person's true sleep drive, we basically have them adjust the amount of time they're in bed relative to their true sleep drive, which is their sleep appetite. So how much sleep do your, does your mind and body truly require? Let's try to adjust how much time you're in bed so that you, your mind and body produce that much sleep. Okay. And so we do that in steps and it's called like mm -hmm. sleep restriction or sleep compression. We make these small adjustments to the person's time in bed until their time in bed is optimized yeah. to their sleep drive. So Michael, have you tried to work with something like the Aura Ring or the Fitbit that also measures people's sleep stages for optimizing that? Yes, thank you for that question, Matt. Um, I generally, if you, again, I wanna ask you know, your listeners to put themselves into one camp, either the camp of people who struggle with chronic insomnia yeah. or people who don't. If you don't struggle with chronic insomnia, uh, you know, those kinds of uh, sleep trackers are fine. They're fine, although they're not yes. very accurate because they are based upon accelerators, uh, accelerometers, and that is not actually a good measure of sleep. It's just a measure of restlessness right? while you sleep. And there can be many factors that contribute to that. But if you have... You know, if you if you don't struggle with insomnia, it's fine. You know, you can be curious about it. Probably a rough estimate of how of your sleep, that's fine. But if you struggle with insomnia, I really recommend you not not have one of those. Um, any uh, in the same way that I would not recognize that you have a clock in your bedroom, all right? Um, I would not. I would reckon, uh, recommend you not have a phone in your bedroom. Anything, any device that you're going to use to check whether you're asleep or not, or how well you slept, I would not recommend. Um, what, will, what happens for people with chronic insomnia is that they, they get up in the morning and they have the thought, gee, I think I, I slept reasonably well. Then they look at their, their tracker and their tracker says, you didn't sleep well. Now they went from a, a, an evaluation of I slept pretty well and feeling pretty good and not particularly anxious about it to checking their tracker and now having the view that they didn't sleep well and being worried about it. So I do not recommend people who struggle with insomnia. Use I think those that devices. point is su super important, Michael. So something that I often talk to friends with and I'm very much in this, will you say, biohacking, quantify itself environment as well. And I both have the Aura Ring and the Fitbit. But I also interviewed mm -hmm. Chuck Hazard from Aura Ring that talked about how accurate it actually was with the sleep stages, where he was like mm -hmm. very much critiquing how much we actually know about sleep stages and how we decided 50 years mm -hmm. ago, some sleep scientists was like, this is deep sleep. But how little accuracy we got even in a sleep lab. And uh, so we know mm -hmm. there's REM mm -hmm. sleep and non-REM sleep. And and the measurement of how what is deep sleep or not, there's so much debate about that. And I never check my Absolutely. Aura Ring in the morning for the exact same reason as you just said. I don't want it to interfere, especially mm -hmm. when it's not that accurate and also just understanding the psychology perspective. If I look at my Aura Ring that told me that I slept bad, even though I know that it's not fully accurate, it just it still has that effect. Exactly. That's exactly right. Because it shapes yes. an evaluation that you're making, right? You might go from, oh, I slept reasonably well. That's one evaluation. And then you don't feel so anxious or stressed about your sleep. You feel great. You know, oh, go about your day. Versus 
you look at your tracker and you think, oh my God, I didn't sleep well, which is a different evaluation, which then starts sets you up to start worrying about your sleep, worrying about your the the next night's sleep and worrying about how you're going to perform today, quote, with Just... less sleep. Right. So I do not really recommend the use of those if you struggle with chronic insomnia. Again, if you don't, it's not mm -hmm. it's neither here nor there. It makes probably little or no difference in terms of, of your so, sleep. But if you have insomnia, I think that's a really good advice. It. I've used it so I looked at it in the evening. So when it can't affect my day. So to try and look at, is there anything mm -hmm. I could learn from the day before for how to optimize mm -hmm. my sleep? But I think mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are really mm -hmm. struggling because they are using these sleep devices and they get so stressed yeah. about yeah. the results where I'm like, try and put it away exactly. or at least only look at it in the evening or look at it once a week right. and then look at how we're like your resting heart rate and some of those other measures or uh, temperature that we know are a bit more accurate than the sleep stages. And then, like, what were some of the things that you did? Something with exercise, potentially, or food, and so on. I know a friend saw something very clear with alcohol. He was pretty surprised when he saw he didn't have sleep problems, but he had two glasses of red wine, and he could see his temperature and other things changing quite a lot. And he didn't Absolutely. realize how that mm -hmm. was impacting the body. So that was something for him to change after he saw several times what alcohol actually did to his temperature and so on. Yep, exactly, exactly. And... The other thing about those trackers is, and I, is that probably the most important thing about having uh, restorative sleep is to be in an accepting attitude towards sleep. When you have uh, chronic insomnia, you're in a control attitude towards sleep or an effort attitude towards sleep. You try to get to sleep. You try to go to sleep. The problem with a control attitude about your sleep is that we actually don't control our sleep. You know, we've never controlled our sleep. There are periods, even if you struggle with insomnia now, there have been periods in your life when you were younger that you just laid down and sleep came. You didn't go to sleep. Even though people may have told you to go to sleep, you didn't go to sleep. You know, you laid down, your mind was and body was open to sleep, and sleep came. So one of the things that I really teach my clients is that no matter what strategy you use, whether it be relaxation or mindfulness, uh, that whatever that strategy is, if you use it mm. to go to sleep, to try to get to sleep, it will create problems for you. What you want to do is to use mindfulness, for example, as something for you to do that prepares your mind and body for sleep when sleep decides to come, right? So it is really an accepting attitude about sleep. We Sleep doesn't really need our help. Our minds and bodies know how to sleep. We've been programmed to sleep. Our minds and bodies know how to sleep. They don't need our help. What happens when you develop chronic insomnia is you actually get in the way of that pro natural process. You know, if you can step out of the way of that natural process, that natural process will, will happen if, if, if your sleep disruptions are, are influenced uh, by you know. That's an insomnia. interesting perspective that you're not using mindfulness to get to sleep. You're using it to prepare yourself for sleep because then you're not lying right. and Yeah, and you're not lying and critical. worrying that, yeah. oh, I'm not falling asleep. You're just like, I'm relaxing and enjoying exactly. this. And then at some point, I will fall asleep. That's exactly right. And it's critical. The other part about it is, too, is that there are, lot, there are other strategies like savoring, which I'm, I'm a big fan of, which is basically, you know, uh, an eyes, eye closed exercise where you basically just savor certain experiences that you have. In, Uh, you've had during the day, the way you may savor a meal, a really pleasant meal. You're savoring that. And and so there are certain exercises that actually not only prepare your mind for sleep, but actually make uh, the waiting for sleep less unpleasant. Because when you struggle with insomnia, lying in, wake, uh, in bed awake is, is punishing. 
It's, it's an aversive experience. It's a very punishing experience. And that alone would make you feel anxious about how long you're going to be awake before sleep. So some of these strategies, again, are not to get to sleep, but they're actually to help you to make the waiting less unpleasant you know, while you're waiting, um, which is another critical factor. Let's see if we can make the waiting for sleep a little less unpleasant. Got it. Other final things to do in regards to sleep that people can, after listening, be like, I'm going to try and implement that. There are some, uh, one of the things, uh, sleep hygiene, which um, a lot of times, this is what people start with, like quiet bedroom, cool bedroom, um, uh, things like that. Th those, those are important things for you to consider, but they have actually very little influence over insomnia. They, if you don't have insomnia, they're, they're, they're good things to do. So what I really uh, recommend is that you engage in some pre preparation for sleep. So I typically recommend uh, at least an hour wind down routine, which can be hard for people it, it, you know, to actually stop whatever they're doing and shift from like work uh, to some to a wind down routine. And I often recommend they do a wind down routine that is the same every night. Right. So uh, where you uh, again, we're going to use some conditioning. We're going to kind of signal to the mind and body oh, it's time to prepare for sleep. So I might listen to the same music. Um, I might uh, prepare some chamomile tea and drink it from the same mug. I would dim the lights. I would play some uh, the same uh, calming music or engage in the same calming activity. But try to make it the same, right? Uh, identically the same if possible. Again, to kind of condition your mind, time to slow down, prepare for sleep. And then the last thing I would recommend, would, I mean, the, uh, is that I would recommend you not do anything in bed other than uh, sleep and sex and if you're sick and really take those activities out of the bed um, because uh, working on sleep drive through conditioned arousal is a very powerful intervention. And if you can just build that habit in, it can make, in a matter of uh, days and a, a week, uh, some uh, really significant changes in uh, your sleep onset and staying asleep. Got it. I try to do something as simple as put my phone to sleep in my kitchen or in my living room. So I leave it there. Uh, that's a really good point, Matt that actually I recommend people, unless there's a real good reason to have your phone in your bedroom, I recommend you take your phone out of your bedroom. And uh, people will say, oh, but that's my alarm clock. Well, we had alarm clocks before we had phones. So get yourself an old conventional alarm clock and get your phone out of the bedroom. Because, because if you don't turn off notifications, You'll be your sleep will be disrupted, or even more importantly, there. What a phone prompts arousal. Think about the amount of time that we're actually on a phone over the course of a day, particularly a smartphone. You're checking this. You're doing this. You're doing that. Your mind has been conditioned to be aroused because of this device. When you keep that device in your bedroom, even if you're not using it, your mind is powerfully linked to that device, and that will influence your mental arousal. So I like what you're saying. Move those devices out of the bedroom. If you have a family, as a family, put all your devices to bed. You know, if you have kids, all devices go to bed. Have a place, a charging station out of a bedroom where you charge all the phones on that, uh, but they're out of the bedroom. That's a really important point you're raising. And it's so simple. Well, it's hard to break the habit. Mm -hmm. And I still find myself sometimes taking it into the bedroom, but I really try to put it at flight mode, leave it, 
for charging. And yeah. then I bought an alarm clock many years ago, which is the Philips that starts to bring natural light in the morning, which helps me wake up Beautiful. much easier. That's been one of my best investments ever because just having light in the room, I also yeah. have really dark curtains. So like this pitch black when I'm sleeping because I've read about high sleep hygiene and so on, optimized sleep. But it really helps me having that light when I wake up that I feel much more fresh. That's another good point, Matt. Like, if you're if if you're having trouble awakening in the morning, light is your friend. So, what I would suggest you do is, if you have trouble getting out of uh, awakening in the morning, you have some, you know, a lot of sleep inertia, um, then get up, go to the windows, drop the blinds, look at the sun. Just go for the sun. If you have trouble in the evening calming down, you know, your mind settling down towards sleep, dim your lights, go away from light, you know? So those two factors are really important uh, as well. Um, and uh, the last thing about devices is if you're, if you set up an hour sleep um, routine where you're, you're just, you know, for the next hour, you're doing calming activities, you're signaling your mind, it's time to sleep. Don't check emails don't check texts don't that's why don't involve yourself with a device during that hour because you never know if you're going to get a text that's going to awaken your mind you're going to get an email that's going to awaken your mind you don't want to be getting that kind of input coming in during an hour in which you're trying to signal to your mind time to calm down and that's not only for sleep It's also just to give the mind a little bit of a break instead of constantly being on. So I'm I'm a flawed Absolutely. human like everyone else, and I'm constantly learning new things. But I can definitely feel that it's it's good for me when I put my phone to sleep mode at 10 o'clock, and then I have the last half an hour to slowly like go to bed, do a relaxed routine, and I don't constantly have the stuff coming in and giving me arousal, as you're saying, that it just, it calms down okay. as well. And I can you, focus more on, I do my gratitude journal and, and thinking more about the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. You're way ahead of, you're way ahead <laughs> so, of us all. That's, I had the pleasure awesome. of talking to a lot of well really done. smart people that I, I try always from one of my interviews to take one thing and implement it after the conversation. So, so wow, that helps. Beautiful. That's a lot of beautiful. a, a lot of habits in the end yeah, it's not possible to keep all of them mm -hmm. so michael you also wrote mm -hmm. several other really interesting books not only on sleep can you say a few words about how people can find them and the areas that they can learn about uh, my books are all available on um, barnes and noble amazon um, i've written a number of books on um, anxiety i've written a book on obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I've written books for professionals. I've also written books on um, hoarding behavior. Um, so, but I really have spent uh, quite a bit of time writing books for teens. So I have a number of books for teens on stress and relaxation, a teen book on uh, insomnia, and I have a teen book coming out in September on um, managing anger and irritation important important areas as well and you also have a private clinic where you do consultations and now you actually yes. do online consultations so if i have international listeners oh well okay. i can't do that because i'm not licensed in you know uh, outside of the united you know, states in fact i'm not licensed outside of california so But if you have listeners who would like me to refer them to a cognitive behavior therapist in their community or in their country, I am happy to do that. That sounds great. Thank you so much for that, Michael. Any last parting advice for the listeners out there? If you have to give one to three advice for either sleep or life in general, something that you learned that you wish you had learned before? Yeah, I I think that probably my... the. The, the message that I have taken home, and I'm really practicing uh, myself a great deal to these days, is gratitude. Um, is that uh, 
in spite of the difficulties we're all experiencing uh, today uh, about the many things that are going on in the world, at the end of the day, there's always something that I can be grateful for. And what we know about gratitude is gratitude is the pathway to happiness. And this is why people with many people with so little who are grateful for what they have can be so happy about being uh, present in the world. So I really am practicing gratitude. That is one of my favorites as well, Michael. So I'm really glad to hear someone with a really good education say that as well. So I'm not just preaching it in most episodes. The listeners that <laughs> uh, follow several episodes will hear me in every second episode speak about a gratitude journal and and stop and reflect on yeah. the small pleasures in life that don't have to be that great. That's right. And even like gratitude meditations or even like gratitude, you know, it, you know, being mindful in a grateful way, like if you walk, um, like I walk in my neighborhood and there are beautiful gardens and being grateful that not only that I have this beauty around me, but actually I can see that beauty. You know, I can smell the fragrance of a rose. I can see the beauty of a rose. Um, those fundamental things um, are all of us can be grateful for. I think that's a beautiful closing remark. I will make sure to put the, in the show notes links to your website so people can find you and also the books. So it's super easy to find you afterwards. So Michael, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate talking to you. Max, it has been a pleasure. You are a very thoughtful and gracious interviewer. So thank you so much.